they made the verdict form yellow. They each have their own verdict form attached to their packet, but I, somebody mentioned, I think it's a great idea, this is the official verdict form. I won't give it to them until tomorrow. Remind me. Then, what I'm going to do is give both sides some packets. What I ask you to do is, I don't know, when I was passing them out, maybe I'm just being paranoid. Some of the packets just felt smaller than the other packets. Could be wrong. Here's what I want to do. If somebody raises their hand and says, on page 27, we're missing it, somebody note which juror it is that I can keep reading and we'll supplement their packet when we're done. Okay? But you got to help me because I'm going to be reading going, going. <coughs> And please thank um, your assistant for making the copies. Excuse me? Please thank your assistant for making the copies. Sure. We finally got the printer working the other day. The last day of the trial. Last day of the trial. And some of you will have clips. Some of you have the gigantic stapler then gave out on us too. Because the packets are so thick. All right, everybody have a seat, jurors. Thank you for your patience. We were working two copiers at the same time, and it just took a very long time to make so many copies of such a thick packet. Some of you have clips on your uh, instructions, and others have staples, because even the gigantic stapler gave out on us. So I apologize. Um, what I want you to do is follow along with me, as I said, and then if um, I, I felt some of the packets, I put them on your chairs. I don't know, I might be just compulsive, felt a little smaller than the others. If you're missing a page, what I want you to do is raise your hand. The lawyer's gonna keep track of who raised their hand and what page, and I'll supplement your packet this evening. That way we can keep moving, okay? So here we go. Members of the jury, I thank you for your attention during this trial. Please pay attention to the instructions I'm about to give you. Christopher Posada, the defendant in this case, has been accused of the crime of three counts of first-degree murder with a firearm, attempted first-degree murder with a firearm, and grand theft motor vehicle. In considering the evidence, you should consider the possibility that although the evidence may not convince you that the defendant committed the main crimes of which he's accused, there may be evidence that he committed other acts that would constitute a lesser-included crime or crimes. Therefore, if you decide that the main accusation has not been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, you will next need to decide if the defendant is guilty of any lesser included crime. The lesser crimes indicated in the definition of first degree murder with a firearm, attempted first degree murder with a firearm, grand theft motor vehicle are, as to the first degree murder with a firearm, it's second degree murder with a firearm and manslaughter. As to the attempted first degree murder with a firearm, attempted second degree murder with a firearm, and aggravated assault with a firearm, there are no lessers to the grand theft. Principles. Christopher Sada helped another person or persons commit or attempt to commit a crime, he is a principal and must be treated as if he had done all the things the other person or persons did if the state proves each element of the crime charged beyond a reasonable doubt and the state proves each of the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, the defendant had a conscious intent that the criminal act be done and two, the defendant did some act or said some word which was intended to and which did incite cause, encourage, assist, or advise the other person or persons to actually commit or attempt to commit the crime. To be a principal, Christopher Sada does not have to be present when the crime is committed or attempted. Introduction to homicide. In count one, Christopher Sada is accused of first degree murder with a firearm of Sean Henry. Murder in the first degree includes the lesser crimes of murder in the second degree and manslaughter, all of which are unlawful. A killing that is excusable or is committed by the use of justifiable deadly force is lawful. 
If you find Sean Henry was killed by Christopher Posada, you will then consider the circumstances surrounding the killing and deciding if the killing was first degree murder, murder in the second degree, or manslaughter, or whether the killing was excusable or resulted from justifiable use of deadly force. The killing of a human being is justifiable homicide and lawful if necessarily done while resisting an attempt to murder or commit a felony upon the defendant or to commit a felony in any dwelling house in which the defendant was at the time of the killing. Excusable homicide, the killing of a human being is excusable and therefore lawful under any one of the following three circumstances. One, when the killing is committed by accident, misfortune, and doing any lawful act by lawful means with usual ordinary caution and without any unlawful intent, or two, when the killing occurs by accident, misfortune, the heat of passion, upon any sudden sufficient provocation, or three, when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune resulting from a sudden combat, the dangerous weapon is not used and the killing is not done in a cruel or unusual manner. Now, dangerous weapon is any weapon that, taking into account the manner in which it is used, is likely to produce death or great bodily harm. I now instruct you on the circumstances that must be proved before Christopher Posada may be found guilty of first degree murder with a firearm or any lesser included offense. Murder, first degree. To prove the crime of first degree premeditated murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Sean Henry is dead. Two, the death was caused by the criminal act of Christopher Posada. And three, there was a premeditated killing of Sean Henry. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. Killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. The law does not fix the exact period of time that must pass between the formation of the premeditated intent to kill and the killing. The period of time must be long enough to allow reflection by the defendant. The premeditated intent to kill must be formed before the killing. The question of premeditation is a question of fact to be determined by you from the evidence. It will be sufficient proof of premeditation if the circumstances of the killing and the conduct of the accused convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of premeditation at the time of the killing. An issue in this case is whether Christopher Posada did not act with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. In order to find that the defendant did not act with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, A, there must have been a sudden event that would have suspended the exercise of judgment in an ordinary reasonable person, and B, a reasonable person would have lost normal self-control and would have been driven by a blind and unreasoning fury, and C, there was not reasonable amount of time for a reasonable person to cool off, and D, a reasonable person would not have cooled off before committing the act that caused death, and E, Christopher Posada was, in fact, so provoked and did not cool off before he committed the act that caused the death of Sean Henry. If you have a reasonable doubt about whether the defendant acted with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, you should find him not guilty of first degree premeditated murder. If you find that the defendant committed first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree murder with possession of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree murder with discharge of a firearm. If you find the defendant committed first degree murder and also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm and in doing so caused the death of Sean Henry, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree murder with the discharge of a firearm causing death. A firearm is defined as any weapon, including a starter gun, which will, is designed to, or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive. The frame or receiver or any such, I think should be of any such weapon. Any firearm muffler or firearm silencer, any destructive device or any machine gun. The term firearm does not include an antique firearm unless the antique firearm is used in the commission of a crime. Murder, second degree. To prove the crime of second degree murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Sean Henry is dead. Two, the death was caused by the criminal act of Christopher Posada. And three, there was an unlawful killing of Sean Henry by an act imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. 
an act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. An act is imminently, imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act or series of acts that, one, a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another, and two, is done for ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent, and three, is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. In order to convict the in order to convict of second-degree murder, it is not necessary for the, for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to cause death. An issue in this case is whether Christopher Posada did not have a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. In order to find that the defendant did not have a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, a, there must have been a sudden event that would have suspended the exercise of judgment in an ordinary reasonable person, and, and B, a reasonable person would have lost normal self-control and would have been driven by a blind and unreasoning fury, and C, there was not a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable person to cool off, and D, a reasonable person would not have cooled off before committing the act that caused the death, and E, Christopher Posada was in fact so provoked and did not cool off before he committed the act that caused the death of Sean Henry. If you have a reasonable doubt about whether the defendant had a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, you should find, the, find him not guilty. You should find him guilty of second-degree murder. Let me back that up. Sorry. You should find, not find him guilty of second-degree murder. If you find that the defendant committed second-degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder with possession of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed second-degree murder, and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder with discharge of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed secondary murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm and do, doing so caused the death of Sean Henry, you should find the defendant guilty of secondary murder with discharge of a firearm causing death. If you find the defendant guilty of secondary murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use any weapon or a firearm in the course of committing secondary murder, you should find him guilty of second-degree murder with a weapon or firearm. A firearm has been previously defined for you. I read it a couple pages ago. To prove the crime of manslaughter, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Sean Henry is dead. Two, to A, Christopher Posada intentionally committed an act or acts that caused the death of Sean Henry, or B, the death of Sean Henry was caused by the culpable negligence of Christopher Posada. Every person has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there is a violation of that duty without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence. The defendant cannot be guilty of manslaughter by committing a merely negligent act, or if the killing was either justifiable or excusable homicide, as I previously instructed you. In order to convict of manslaughter, it is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant had an intent to cause death only an intent to commit an act that was not merely negligent, justified, or excusable, and which caused death. I will now define culpable negligence for you. As I've said, every person has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there is a violation of that duty without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence. But culpable negligence is more than a failure to use ordinary care towards others. In order for negligence to be culpable, it must be gross and flagrant. Culpable negligence is a course of conduct showing reckless disregard of human life or of the safety of persons exposed to its dangerous effects or such an entire want of care as to raise a presumption of a conscious indifference to consequences or which shows wantonness or recklessness or a grossly careless disregard for the safety and welfare of the public or such an indifference to the rights of others as is equivalent to an intentional violation of such rights. The negligent act or omission must have been committed with an utter disregard for the safety of others. 
Culpable negligence is consciously doing an act or following a course of conduct that the defendant must have known or reasonably should have known was likely to cause death or great bodily injury. If you find the defendant guilty of the crime of manslaughter, then you must further determine beyond a reasonable doubt if, in the course of committing the manslaughter, the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a weapon. If you find that the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a weapon in the course of committing the manslaughter, you should find him guilty of manslaughter with a weapon. A weapon is defined to mean any object that could be used to cause death or inflict serious bodily harm. If you find that the defendant carried no weapon in the course of committing manslaughter, but did commit manslaughter, you should find him guilty only of manslaughter. In count two, Christopher Posada is accused of first degree murder with a firearm of Brandy al Sali. Murder in the first degree includes the lesser crimes of murder in the second degree and manslaughter, all of which are unlawful. A killing that is excusable but is committed by the use of justifiable use, justifiable deadly force is lawful. If you find Brandy al Sali was killed by Christopher Posada, you will then consider the circumstances surrounding the killing in deciding if the killing was first degree murder, murder in the second degree, or manslaughter, or whether the killing was excusable or resulted from justifiable use of deadly force. Justifiable and excusable homicide have previously been explained to you. To prove the crime of first degree premeditated murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Brandy El Sali is dead. Two, the death was caused by the criminal act of Christopher Posada. And three, there was a premeditated killing of Brandy El Sali. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. Killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. The law does not fix the exact period of time that must pass between the formation of the premeditated intent to kill and the killing. The period of time must be long enough to allow reflection by the defendant. The premeditated intent to kill must be formed before the killing. If the defendant had a premeditated design to kill one person and in attempting to kill that person actually kills another person, the killing is premeditated. The question of premeditation is a question of fact to be determined by you from the evidence. It will be sufficient proof of premeditation if the circumstances of the killing and the conduct of the accused convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of premeditation at the time of the killing. An issue in this case is whether Christopher Posada did not act with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. In order to find that the defendant did not act with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, A, there must have been a sudden event that would have suspended the exercise of judgment in an ordinary reasonable person, and B, a reasonable person would have lost normal self-control and would have been driven by a blind and unreasoning fury. And C, there was not a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable person to cool off. And D, a reasonable person would not have cooled off before committing the act that caused death. And E, Christopher Posada was in fact so provoked and did not cool off before he committed the act that caused the death of Brandy L. Sully. If you have a reasonable doubt about whether the defendant acted with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, you should not find him guilty of first degree premeditated murder. If you find that the defendant committed first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree murder with possession of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree murder with discharge of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm and doing so caused the death of, I think we repeated the wrong name there, am I correct? Lawyers, everybody's in agreement. It says Sean Henry again, it should say Brandy El Sully. So, jurors, everybody has their pen. Scratch out the Sean Henry, please, and put Brandy El Sully. <laughs> so,
So let me go back and read that paragraph again. If you find that the defendant committed first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm and in doing so caused the death of Brandy L. Sully, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree murder with the discharge of a firearm causing death. A firearm has been previously defined for you. Second degree murder as it relates to this count. To prove the crime of second degree murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Brandy L. Sully is dead. Two, the death was caused by the criminal act of Christopher Posada. Three, there was an unlawful killing of Brandy L. Sully by an act imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. An act is imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act, a series of acts that, one, a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another and, two, is done for ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent and, three, is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. In order to convict of secondary murder, it is not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to cause death. An issue in this case is whether Christopher Basada did not have a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. In order to find that the defendant did not have a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. A through E, I'll read them again. There must have been a sudden event that would have suspended the exercise of judgment in an ordinary reasonable person. And a reasonable person would have lost normal self-control and would have been driven by a blind and unreasoning fury, and there was not a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable person to cool off, and a reasonable person would not have cooled off before committing the act that caused the death, and Christopher Fasada was in fact so provoked and did not cool off before he committed the act that caused the death of Brandy L. Sully. If you have a reasonable doubt whether the defendant had a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, you should not find him guilty of second-degree murder. If you find that the defendant committed second-degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder with possession of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed second-degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder with discharge of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed secondary murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually discharged a firearm and in doing so caused the death of Brandy L. Sully, you should find the defendant guilty of secondary murder with discharge of a firearm causing death. If you find the defendant guilty of secondary murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use any weapon or firearm in the course of committing secondary murder, you should find him guilty of secondary murder with a weapon or firearm. A firearm has previously been defined for you. To prove the crime of manslaughter, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Brandy L. Sully is dead. Two, Christopher Posada intentionally committed an act or acts that caused the death of Brandy L. Sully. Or, the death of Brandy L. Sully was caused by the culpable negligence of Christopher Posada. Every person has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there's a violation of that duty without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence. The defendant cannot be guilty of manslaughter by committing a merely negligent act or if the killing was either justifiable or excusable homicide, as I previously instructed you. In order to convict of manslaughter by act, it is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant had an intent to cause death only intent to commit an act that was not merely negligent, justified, or excusable, and which caused death. I will now define culpable negligence for you. As I've said, every person has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there's a violation of that duty without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence. But culpable negligence is more than a failure to use ordinary care towards others. In order for negligence to be culpable, it must be gross and flagrant. Culpable negligence is a course of conduct showing reckless disregard of human life or of the safety of persons exposed to its dangerous effects or such an entire want of care as to raise a presumption of conscious indifference to consequences or which shows wantonness or recklessness or a grossly careless disregard for the safety and welfare of the public or 
such an indifference to the rights of others as is equivalent to an intentional violation of such rights. The negligent act or omission must have committed with an utter disregard for the safety of others. Culpable negligence is consciously doing an act or following a course of conduct that the defendant must have known or reasonably should have known was likely to cause death or great bodily injury. If you find the defendant guilty of the crime of manslaughter, then you must further determine beyond a reasonable doubt if in the course of committing the manslaughter, the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a weapon. If you find that the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a weapon in the course of committing the manslaughter, you should find him guilty of manslaughter with a weapon. A weapon has previously been defined for you. If you find that the defendant carried no weapon in the course of committing manslaughter, but did commit manslaughter, you should find him guilty only of manslaughter. In count three, Christopher Passat is accused of first degree murder with a firearm, Kelly Doherty. Murder in the first degree includes the lesser crimes of murder in the second degree and manslaughter, all of which are unlawful. A killing that is excusable or was committed by the use of justifiable deadly force is lawful. If you find Kelly Doherty was killed by Christopher Passat, you will then consider the circumstances surrounding the killing and deciding if the killing was first degree murder murder in the second degree or manslaughter, or whether the killing was excusable or resulted from the justifiable use of deadly force. Justifiable and excusable homicide have been previously explained to you. To prove the crime of first degree premeditated murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Kelly Doherty is dead. Two, the death was caused by the criminal act of Christopher Vasada, And three, it was a premeditated killing of Kelly Doherty. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed to pursuant to a single design or purpose. Killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. The law does not fix the exact period of time that must pass between the formation of the premeditated intent to kill and the killing. The period of time must be long enough to allow reflection by the defendant. The premeditated intent to kill must be formed for the killing. If the defendant had a premeditated design to kill one person and an attempt to kill that person actually killed another person, the killing is premeditated. The question of premeditation is a question of fact to be determined by you from the evidence. It will be sufficient proof of premeditation if the circumstances of the killing and the conduct of the accused convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of premeditation at the time of the killing. An issue in this case is whether Christopher Posada did not act with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. In order to find that the defendant did not act with premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, there must have been a sudden event that would have suspended the exercise of judgment in an ordinary reasonable person. And a reasonable person would have lost normal self-control and would have been driven by a blind and an unreasoning fury and there was not a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable person to cool off, and a reasonable person would not have cooled off before committing the act that caused the death, and Christopher Fasada was in fact so provoked and did not cool off before he committed the act that caused the death of Kelly Doherty. If you have a reasonable doubt about, about whether the defendant acted with premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, you should not find him guilty of first degree premeditated murder. If you find the defendant committed first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree murder with possession of a firearm. If you find the defendant committed first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree murder with discharge of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm and in doing so caused the death of Kelly Doherty, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree murder with discharge of a firearm causing death. To prove the crime of second degree murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Kelly Doherty is dead. The death was caused by the criminal act of Crystal Vitsada. And three, there was an unlawful killing of Kelly Doherty by an act imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. 
An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. An act is imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act or series of acts that a person of ordinary judgment we know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another and is done from ill will to hatred, spite, or an evil intent and is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. In order to convict of second degree murder, it is not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to cause death. An issue in this case is whether Christopher Posada did not have a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on an adequate provocation. In order to find that the defendant did not have a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, there must have been a sudden event that would have suspended the exercise of judgment in an ordinary reasonable person and a reasonable person would have lost normal self-control and would have been driven by a blind and unreasoning fury and there was not a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable person to cool off and a reasonable person would not have cooled off before committing the act that caused the death and Christopher Visada was in fact so provoked and did not cool off before he committed the act that caused the death of Kelly Doherty. If you have a reasonable doubt about whether the defendant had a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, you should not find him guilty of secondary murder. If you find that the defendant committed secondary murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that the, during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of secondary murder with possession of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed secondary murder and also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of secondary murder with discharge of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed secondary murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm and in doing so caused the death of Kelly Doherty, you should find the defendant guilty of secondary murder with discharge of a firearm causing death. If you find the defendant guilty of secondary murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use any weapon or a firearm in the course of committing secondary murder, you should find him guilty of secondary murder with a weapon or firearm. A firearm has been previously defined for you. To prove the crime of manslaughter, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Kelly Doherty is dead. Two, Christopher Posada intentionally committed an act or acts that caused the death of Kelly Doherty, or the death of Kelly Doherty was caused by the culpable negligence of Christopher Posada. Now, every person has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there's a violation of that duty without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence. The defendant cannot be guilty of manslaughter by committing a merely negligent act, it, act or if the killing was either justifiable or excusable homicide, as I previously instructed you. In order to convict of manslaughter by act, it is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant had an intent to cause death, only an intent to commit an act that was not merely negligent, justified, or excusable, and which caused death. I will now define culpable negligence for you. As I've said, every person has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there's a violation of that duty without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence. But culpable negligence is more than a failure to use ordinary care towards others. In order for negligence to be culpable, it must be gross and flagrant. Culpable negligence is a course of conduct showing reckless disregard of human life or of the safety of persons exposed to its dangerous effects or such an entire want of care as to raise a presumption of a conscious indifference to consequences or which shows wantonness or recklessness or a grossly careless disregard for the safety and welfare of the public or such an indifference to the rights of others as is equivalent to an intentional violation of such rights. The negligent act or omission must have been committed with an utter disregard for the safety of others. Culpable negligence consciously doing an act or following a course of conduct that the defendant must have known or reasonably should have known was likely to cause death or great bodily injury. If you find the defendant guilty of the crime of manslaughter, then you must further determine beyond a reasonable doubt if in the course of committing the manslaughter, the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a weapon. If you find the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a weapon in the course of committing the manslaughter, you should find him guilty of manslaughter with a weapon. A weapon has previously been defined for you. If you find the defendant carried no weapon, in the course of committing manslaughter, but did commit the manslaughter, you should find him guilty only of manslaughter.
In count four, Christopher Passat is accused of attempted first degree murder with the firearm of Charles Vorpagel. Attempted murder in the first degree includes the lesser crimes of attempted murder in the second degree and aggravated assault with a firearm, all of which are unlawful. An attempted homicide that is excusable or was committed by the use of justifiable deadly force is lawful. If you find that there was an attempted homicide of Charles Vorpagel, Christopher Sada, I think we need to just scratch through the Mr. Vasada's name there, right? It should read, if you find that there was an attempted homicide of Charles Vorpagel, you will then consider the circumstances surrounding the attempted homicide and deciding whether it was attempted first degree murder or attempted second degree murder or aggravated assault or whether the attempted homicide was excusable or resulted from justifiable use of deadly force. An attempted homicide is justifiable and lawful if necessarily done while resisting an attempt to murder or commit a felony upon the defendant or to commit a felony in any dwelling house in which the defendant was at the time of the attempted homicide. An attempted homicide is excusable and therefore lawful under any one of the three following circumstances. When the attempted homicide is committed by accident and misfortune in doing any lawful act by lawful means with usual ordinary caution and without any unlawful intent or when the attempted homicide occurs by accident and misfortune in the heat of passion upon any sudden and sufficient provocation or when the attempted homicide is committed by accident and misfortune resulting from a sudden combat, the dangerous weapon is not used and the attempted homicide is not done in a cruel and unusual manner. Dangerous weapon is any weapon that, taken into account the manner in which it is used, is likely to produce death or great bodily harm. I now instruct you on in the circumstances that must be proved before the defendant may be found guilty of attempted first degree murder or any lesser included crime. To prove the crime of attempted first degree premeditated murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Christopher Fasada did some act intended to cause the death of Charles Warpagel that went beyond just thinking or talking about it. Two, Christopher Sada acted with a premeditated design to kill Charles Warpagel. Three, the act would have resulted in the death of Charles Warpagel, except that someone prevented Christopher Sada from killing Charles Warpagel or he failed to do so. A premeditated design to kill means that there was a conscious decision to kill. The decision must be present in the mind at the time the act was committed. The law does not fix the exact period of time that must pass between the formation of the premeditated intent to kill and the act. The period of time must be long enough to allow reflection by the defendant. The premeditated intent to kill must be formed before the act was committed. The question of premeditation is a question of fact to be determined by you from the evidence. It will be sufficient proof of premeditation if the circumstances of the attempted killing and the conduct of the accused convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of premeditation at the time of the attempted killing. An issue in this case is whether Christopher Vasada did not act with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. In order to find the defendant did not act with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, there must have been a sudden event that would have suspended the exercise of judgment in an ordinary reasonable person and a reasonable person would have lost normal self-control and would have been driven by a blind and unreasoning fury and there was not a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable person to cool off and a reasonable person would not have cooled off before committing the act that constituted the attempt to cause death and Christopher Vasada was in fact so provoked and did not cool off before he committed the act that constituted the attempt to cause the death of Charles Vorpagel. If you have a reasonable doubt about whether the defendant acted with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, you should not find him guilty of attempted first degree premeditated murder. It is not an attempt to commit first degree murder if the defendant abandoned the attempt to commit the offense or otherwise prevented the commission under circumstances indicating a complete and voluntary renunciation of his criminal purpose. If you find the defendant committed attempted first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually possessed a firearm, you should find him guilty of attempted first degree murder with possession of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed attempted first degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of attempted first degree murder with discharge of a firearm. 
If you find the defendant guilty of attempted first degree murder, and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use any weapon or firearm in the course of committing attempted first degree murder, you should find him guilty of attempted first degree murder with a weapon. If you find the defendant carried no firearm or weapon in the course of committing attempted first degree murder, but did commit attempted first degree murder, you should find him guilty only of attempted first degree murder. A firearm has previously been defined for you. Attempted second degree murder. To prove the crime of attempted second degree murder, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Christopher Basada intentionally committed an act which would have resulted in the death of Charles Vorpagel, except that someone prevented Christopher Basada from killing Charles Lewis Vorpagel. Take out the Lewis there, it's just Charles Vorpagel, or he failed to do so. Two, the act was imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. An act is imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act or series of acts that a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another and is done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent and is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. In order to convict the defendant of attempted secondary murder, it is not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to cause death. An issue in this case is whether Christopher Posada did not have a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. In order to find that the defendant did not have a depraved mind without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, there must have been a sudden event that would have suspended the exercise of judgment in an ordinary reasonable person and a reasonable person would have lost normal self-control and would have been driven by a blind and unreasoning fury and there was not a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable person to cool off and a reasonable person would not have cooled off before committing the act that would have resulted in death and Christopher Sada was in fact so provoked and did not cool off before he committed the act that would have resulted in the death of Charles Warpagel. If you have a reasonable doubt about whether the defendant had a depraved mind without regard to human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, you should not find him guilty of attempted second degree murder. It is not an attempt to commit second degree murder if the defendant abandoned the attempt to commit the offense or otherwise prevent its commission under circumstances in indicating complete and voluntary renunciation of his criminal purpose. If you find the defendant committed attempted second degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime the defendant himself actually possessed a firearm, you should find him guilty of attempted second degree murder with possession of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed attempted second degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime the defendant himself discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of attempted second degree murder with discharge of a firearm. If you find the defendant guilty of attempted second degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, that should be used, or attempted to use any weapon or a firearm in the course of committing attempted second degree murder, you should find him guilty of attempted second degree murder with a weapon. If you find that the defendant carried no firearm in the course of committing attempted second degree murder but did commit attempted second degree murder, you should find him guilty only of attempted second degree murder. A firearm has previously been defined for you. To prove the crime of aggravated assault, the state must prove the following four elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Christopher Posada intentionally and unlawfully threatened either by word or act to do violence to Charles Vorpagel. Two at the time, Char Christopher Posada appeared to have the ability to carry out the threat. Three, the act of Christopher Posada created in the mind of Charles Vorpagel a well-founded fear that the violence was about to take place. And four, the assault was made with a deadly weapon. If the circumstances were such as to ordinarily induce a well-founded fear in the mind of a reasonable person, then Charles Vorpagel may be found to have been in fear. An actual fear on the part of Charles Vorpagel need not be shown. A weapon is a deadly weapon if it is used or threatened to be used in a way likely to produce death or great bodily harm. It's not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant had an intent to kill. If you find that the defendant committed aggravated assault and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of aggravated assault with a firearm and possession of a firearm. If you find the defendant committed aggravated assault and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, the defendant himself actually discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of aggravated assault with a firearm with discharge of a firearm. If you find the defendant guilty of aggravated assault and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, use, 
or attempted to use any weapon in the course of committing aggravated assault, you should find him guilty of aggravated assault with a weapon. A weapon has previously been defined for you. <coughs> theft. To prove the crime of grand theft, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Christopher Posada knowingly and unlawfully obtained or used the property of Sean Henry. He did so with the intent to either temporarily or permanently deprive Sean Henry of his right to the property or any benefit from it. And three, the stolen property was a motor vehicle. Possession, proof of possession of recently stolen property unless satisfactorily explained gives rise to an inference that the person in possession of the property knew or should have known that the property had been stolen. Motor vehicle means an automobile, motorcycle, truck trailer, semi-trailer, truck tractor, and semi-trailer combination any other vehicle operating on the roads of the state used to transport persons or property and propelled by power other than muscular power, but the term does not include traction engines, road rollers, personal delivery devices, special mobile equipment, and vehicles that run only upon a track, bicycles, swamp buggies, or mopeds. Obtains or uses means any manner of taking or exercising control over property, Conduct previously known as stealing, larceny, purloining, abstracting, embezzlement, misapplication, misappropriation, conversion, or obtaining money or property by false pretenses, fraud, deception, or other conduct similar in nature. The defendant has entered plea of not guilty. And this means you must presume or believe the defendant is innocent. The presumption stays with the defendant as to each material allegation in the indictment through each stage of the trial, unless it has been overcome by the evidence to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. To overcome the defendant's presumption of innocence, the state has the burden of proving the crime with which the defendant is charged was committed and the defendant is the person who committed the crime. The defendant is not required to present evidence or to prove anything. Whenever the words reasonable doubt are used, you must consider the following. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. On the other hand, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there's not an abiding conviction of guilt or if having a conviction is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates and the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. It is to the evidence introduced in this trial and to it alone you look for that proof. A reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant may arise from the evidence, a conflict in the evidence, or the lack of evidence. If you have a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty. If you have no reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. Weighing the evidence. It's up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. You should consider how the witnesses acted as well as what they said. Some things you should consider are, one, did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? Two, did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Three, was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Four, did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? And five, does the witness testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? Six, has the witness been offered or received any money, preferred treatment, or other benefit in order to get the witness to testify? Seven, had any pressure or threat been used against the witness that affected the truth of the witness's testimony? Eight, did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? And nine, has the witness been convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor involving dishonesty or false statement? Whether the state has met its burden of proof does not depend upon the number of witnesses it is called or upon the number of exhibits it is offered, but instead upon the nature and quality of the evidence presented. The fact that a witness is employed in law enforcement does not mean that his or her testimony deserves more or less consideration than that of any other witness. Expert witnesses are like other witnesses, with one exception, the law permits an expert witness to give their opinion. However, an expert's opinion is reliable only when given on a subject about which you believe them to be an expert. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the expert's testimony. You must consider the testimony of some witnesses with more caution than others. For example, a witness who hopes to gain more favorable treatment in his or her own case may have a reason to make a false statement in order to strike a good bargain with the state. 
This is particularly true when there's no other evidence tending to agree with what the witness says about the defendant. So while a witness of that kind may be entirely truthful when testifying, you should consider his or her testimony with more caution than the testimony of other witnesses. However, if the testimony of such a witness convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt or the other evidence in the case does so, then you should find the defendant guilty. Now, it's entirely proper for a lawyer to talk to a witness about what testimony the witness would give a call to the courtroom. The witness should not be discredited by talking to a lawyer about his or her testimony. You may rely upon your own conclusion about the credibility of any witness. A juror may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the evidence or the testimony of any witness. The Constitution requires the state to prove its accusation against the defendant. It's not necessary for the defendant to disprove anything, nor is the defendant required to prove his innocence. It's up to the state's state to prove the defendant's guilt by evidence. The defendant exercised a fundamental right by choosing not to be a witness in this case. You must not view this as an admission of guilt or be influenced in any way by his decision. No juror should ever be concerned that the defendant did or did not take the witness stand to give testimony in the case. A statement claimed to have been made by the defendant outside of court has been placed before you. Such a statement should always be considered with caution and weighed with great care to make certain it was freely and voluntarily made. Therefore, you must determine from the evidence that the defendant's alleged statement was knowingly, voluntarily, and freely made. In making this determination, you should consider the total circumstances, including but not limited to, one, whether when the defendant made the statement, he had been threatened in order to get him to make it, and two, whether anyone had promised him anything in order to get him to make it. If you conclude the defendant's out-of-court statement was not freely and voluntarily made, you should disregard it. These are some general rules that apply to your discussions. You must follow these rules in order to return a lawful verdict. You must follow laws that set out these instructions. If you fail to follow the law, your verdict will be a miscarriage of justice. There is no reason for failing to follow the law in this case. All of us are depending upon you to make a wise and legal decision in this matter. This case must be decided only upon the evidence that you've heard from the testimony of the witnesses and have seen in the form of the exhibits and evidence and these instructions. This case must not be decided for or against anyone because you feel sorry for anyone or you're angry at anyone. Remember, the lawyers are not on trial. Your feelings about them should not influence your decision in this case. Your duty is to determine if the defendant has been proven guilty or not in accord with the law. Whatever verdict you render, it must be unanimous. That is, each juror must agree to the same verdict. The answers to the questions on the verdict form must also be unanimous. Your verdict should not be influenced by feelings of prejudice, bias, or sympathy. Your verdict must be based on the evidence and the law contained in these instructions. During this trial, you viewed images of the decedents and their injuries. Although it is proper for you to consider those images to the extent they are relevant to issues that are in dispute in this case, such images can trigger strong emotional reactions. Those emotional reactions, while perfectly normal, must not affect your decision-making process in determining whether the state has proved the crime's charge beyond and to the exclusion of any reasonable doubt. As such, the court strongly cautions you to be aware of any emotional effect on you that these images may have caused and urges you to take special care to ensure that such emotions do not improperly influence your decision-making in this case. During your deliberations, all members of the jury should be civil and respectful in their discussions. Deliberations may, at times, become emotional and disagreements are to be expected, but no juror should ever feel that he or she is being personally attacked because of his or her views. If, in the course of the deliberations, anyone attempts to intimidate, bully, unduly influence, coerce, or threaten you, you must notify the deputy immediately. He will then notify me. I'll take the appropriate action. Now, deciding a verdict is exclusively your job. I cannot participate in that decision in any way. Please disregard anything I may have said or done that makes you think I prefer one verdict over another. You may find the defendant guilty as charged in the indictment, guilty of such lesser-included crime as the evidence may justify or not guilty. If you return a verdict of guilty, it should be for the highest offense, which has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find that no offense has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then, of course, your verdict must be not guilty. The verdict must be unanimous. The verdict must be unanimous. That is, all of you must agree to the same verdict. Only one verdict may be returned as to each crime charged. The verdict must be in writing, and for your convenience, necessary verdict form has been prepared for you. I'm going to get to that. I'm just going to plow through this, and then I'm going to talk to you about the verdict form. A separate crime is charged in each count of the indictment, and although they've been tried together, each crime, the evidence applicable to it, must be considered separately, and a separate verdict returned as to each. 
A finding of guilty or not guilty as to one crime must not affect your verdict as to the other crimes charged. Now, it says in just a few moments you'll be taken to the jury room. You know that's going to start tomorrow afternoon. So I'm just going to read it verbatim because I think I'm required to. In just a few moments, you'll be taken to the jury room by the court deputy. When this happens tomorrow, the first thing you should do is choose a foreperson who will preside over your deliberations. The foreperson should see to it that your discussions are carried on in an organized way and that everyone has a fair chance to be heard. It is also, also the foreperson's job to sign and date the verdict form when all of you agreed on a verdict and to bring the verdict form back to the court when you return. During deliberations, jurors must communicate about the case only with one another and only when all jurors are present in the jury room. If a juror goes to the restroom, the deliberation should stop until the juror returns. You are not to communicate with any person outside the jury about this case. Until you've reached a verdict, you must not talk about this case in person or through the telephone, writing, or electronic communication such as blog, Twitter, email, text message, or any other means. Do not contact anyone to assist you during deliberations. These communication rules apply until I discharge you at the end of the case. If you become aware of any violation of these instructions or any other instruction I've given in this case, you must tell me by giving a note to the court deputy. Many of you may have cell phones, tablets, laptops, or electronic devices here in the courtroom. The rules do not allow you to bring your phones or any of those types of electronic devices into the jury room. So we'll have you leave those on your seat tomorrow. Once I send you back to deliberate, if anybody needs access to it, we'll allow you to call friend, you know, uh, you know, emergencies, things of that sort. But you cannot, nowadays, phones are enabled for the internet. You can't do any research, Google, nothing at all, and you can't contact anybody to help you. So, um, but I don't want to deprive you of communication, child care issues, whatever might happen. If you need to communicate with me, you'll do so by sending a note through the court deputy. If you voted, do not disclose the actual vote in the note. If you have a question, I will talk with the attorneys before I answer, so it may take some time. You may continue deliberations while you wait for my answer. I will answer any questions if I can. Know this, orally here in open court. During the trial, items were received in evidence as exhibits. You may examine whatever exhibits you think will help you during your deliberations. We'll have those all delivered to you after closings are done. Certain things will not be delivered to you, like firearms, etc. If you need to see those things, just write a note. We'll have you come out here, and it'll be in the courtroom, but you can have access to it. In closing, let me remind you that it's important you follow the law spelled out in these instructions in deciding your verdict. There are no other laws that apply to this case. Even if you do not like the laws that must be applied, you must use them. For more than two centuries, we lived by the Constitution and the law, and no juror has the right to violate rules that we all share. So all of you should have a verdict form, a copy of a verdict form, right? But tomorrow, when you actually go back to deliberate, I'm going to give you the official one. And we actually change the colors for you. So we know I had a trial a long time ago. I got two verdict forms came out of there. But we started stuff like this. So you'll have the official one. We'll give it to you tomorrow. Filling out this verdict form meticulously is very, very important. Take your time with it. Follow the questions. It'll make sense to you. So at the top, it has the case number, the caption of the case. And we, the jury, finds as follows. As to count one, which is the count involving Sean Henry, we find the defendant guilty of first agreement with a firearm as charged in the indictment. If you believe that's appropriate and you reach a unanimous decision, you're going to put a big X there or a check mark. All right? And if you find that, and only if you find that, you'll go to the question right below it, which says, if you find the guilty, the defendant guilty of this offense, you must answer the following three questions. And at that juncture, you see, on these three questions, the principal instruction does not apply to the following three questions. So the principal instruction applies to the crime of guilty of first degree murder with a firearm. But we're going to ask you these sub-questions here and I've instructed you that the principal instruction does not apply to these three sub-questions. And there are yes or no questions during the commission of the offense. The defendant himself discharged a firearm, which discharge caused the death or serious bodily injury to Sean Henry. Yes or no? 
Go down to number two, join the commission of the offense to defend himself, discharge a firearm. Yes or no? So we're going to have X's there if you check X on the very first line. So it guides you right down the sheet. If you don't believe the state's proving first degree murder, you'll next go to guilty of second degree murder with a firearm. If you believe that's appropriate, you'll put an X there. And then we have different questions. Same rule applies there. The principal instruction applies to the second degree murder, but does not apply to these yes or no questions. There's four of them. Follow them. Now remember, if you don't believe second degree murder has been proven there, then you're not going to go through these yes or no questions. You're going to proceed down to guilty of manslaughter. If you believe that's appropriate, the principal instruction applies to the manslaughter does not apply to the yes or no question. You'll answer it if you check that box at the guilty of manslaughter. So on and so forth. It repeats itself. Just like when I read the instruction over and over again, I know you were tired of hearing it, but that law requires me to do it. Well, the same questions are asked here. Same rules apply. Filling this out meticulously is so, so important to us. You'll proceed to count three. If you believe guilty of first degree murder with a firearm is charged in the indictment, you check that box. Principal instruction applies there. However, if you do check that box, you have to answer the three questions. As I've told you, I put it right here. The principal instruction does not apply to the yes or no questions there. You proceed on down if that's what you feel is appropriate. And then there's count for four. Same rules. Same rules. And then lastly is count five. You don't have to answer any special questions there. Whoever my four person is is going to date it, it's going to sign it, and then it's going to print their name. So there's a procedure here. We're going to put you in that jury room tomorrow after closings. We put you back there. At that time, the two alternate jurors are going to be excused with a special instruction, and I'll, I'll do that later. Special instruction for the two alternate jurors. You all go back there, collect your foreperson, get to work. You'll have your lunch waiting. Shortly thereafter, we'll knock on the door to give you the official verdict form and the evidence. We'll probably have a cart. There's quite a bit of evidence. We'll, we'll need a cart, Deputy Dunkley, I'd say. Anytime that you need something, knock on the door. Do not come out of either one of those doors. There'll be a deputy there. Just knock. That tells us you need something. If it's a question, put it in writing. Be patient. Sometimes people are scattered about, including me. We got to gather everybody. Then we need to discuss the question. Some questions I can't answer. You may get something back from me that says, we can't answer that question. Keep deliberating. We can answer it. I'll bring it into court, and I'll answer it. If you have a request, judge, we need a break. We need to get out of that room. Just knock on the door. Put it in writing. I'll get you a break. Remember, if we do take one of those breaks, you are not to discuss the case with each other. It's only when you're all together in there. Please, 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 you know how much work has gone into this, how much time we've spent, how many trips back and forth to the courthouse. Please don't violate my rules at this juncture. I'll cover all the instructions I need for right now, state and defense. You're going to tuck your um, jury instructions into your notepad there. Did you put your name on the front of your, put your name on the front of your instructions in case any of you took your own personal notes, in case they fall out, we know who it belongs to. Remember, at the end of this road, I destroy all your notes in a shredder. Unread.
Tomorrow we'll start with closing arguments. As I told you, the state goes first. They get a total of two hours. I'm not sure yet how they're going to divide it. We actually put them on a clock. I'm very decent about that, obviously. Uh, sometimes they use less. Sometimes both sides need a little bit more. But I'm shooting at four hours total. So that'll put us uh, right around 1230 to get you back in there and to begin your deliberations. Do you, do you all have any questions about the procedure? Then I don't see any hands. You're going to be excused for the day. You're going to turn your notepads. Don't Google, research, read anything about this case. Don't discuss it. We'll take you out the back, and I'll see you tomorrow morning around 8.15, hoping to start at 8.30. Okay, thank you so much for your patience. No, he, he said no problem. And Deputy Dunkley's here very early. Everybody's all square? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you so much for your patience. I know it got difficult the last two days. I appreciate it. So all your previous objections are noted, uh, but I thought that the, um, so noted, preserved. But I thought that the uh, we did pretty good with uh, the packets. All seemed to be appropriate. Okay, I'm printing out. I made the changes. The main ones were the Charles Lewis Warpagel, and then with Randy defense that they were okay with. Told them to fix it. So they were I'm not, okay. That, I'm not worried about that. Okay. okay. They were minor. Thank you. I, I, it's always something. No, nah, it was pretty pretty good. I expected it to be a mess on our hands. Thank you for all everybody's patience.